My name is Nick Mancuso. Uh, I was a postdoc at UCLA for several years in Bogdan Pasenuk's lab. I'm a uh, very, very new uh, faculty over at USC in the Biostats division. Um, and uh, so let's just get started. I'm going to talk about uh, a framework for in integrating EQTLs and GWAS summary data to identify uh, likely causal genes. So just uh, real quick, maybe like a show of hands. Who knows what GWAS is, right? This is a, like a big tent, right? So, you know, okay, most people, great. What about EQTLs? Okay, still like most people, great. All right, fantastic. You're all, I can just jump to the end. <laughs> um, let's see, left, oh, there we go. I, off to a great start. Oh, oh, oh. these ones, oh, okay, that's why. Got it, thanks. Oh yeah, previous next, not starting stuff. There we go, all right, fantastic. Um, so just a quick recap, the genome-wide association study is an extremely common and very successful approach to link uh, regions in the genome with disease risk, right? And so the way that typically works is we first gather a large cohort of cases and controls or people with and without some disease. Uh, we quantify the common genetic variation in those individuals typically using some uh, genotyping chip, uh, more rarely sequencing, but most of the time it's some uh, genotyping chip uh, where we uh, have probes for sort of known genetic variation, uh, which we then quantify in these individuals. Um, part of the success of uh, GWAS is the fact that we have extremely large cohorts and uh, rely on very simple models, right? Uh, oftentimes it's just linear regression or logistic regression. Um, the effect sizes that are output of those models are really interpretable. Um, there's no sort of uh, confusion uh, about what they might mean. Um, but the way that the, the principle operates is that what we do is we test for association between a SNP and disease outcome, right? Or, or some quantitative trait like height. So we simply march along the genome, testing each SNP or maybe some small indels, uh, and seeing basically if the variation and uh, the genetics kind of co-varies with the variation in the trait that we're looking at. Um, and so what pops out of that is something called a Manhattan plot, that's one way to visualize it, um, where the x-axis indicates the genomic location and the y-axis represents the strength of the association signal, right? So the higher the point, the more associated that SNP is with the disease outcome. Um, so GWAS has been applied to, at this point, thousands of traits, maybe tens of thousands. Um, and what it does not provide are causal mechanisms, okay? So what does it provide? I kind of alluded to this in the previous slide, is it simply gives us regions that are associated with disease outcome or the quantitative trait, right? It doesn't tell us how that trait uh, risk is mediated, right? Or how that quantitative trait is altered in some way. Um, so the question is, given the GWAS data, what are the mechanisms through which risk is imparted? Um, one of the things that we do know is that most associations are non-coding, right? So coding uh, variants change the protein product, uh, right? It's, it's sort of directly interpretable what the action is, right? The, the, we know it's assigned to a particular gene. It's changing the product. If that coding variant reliably associates with some disease outcome, then it's clear that that's the particular gene that's driving risk, right? Because some variant of protein's being produced. However, given the fact that most are non-coding, right? Most, uh, these associations lie in uh, regulatory uh, regions, regions with like strong regulatory annotations through various consortia. And the hypothesis there is that risk is imparted through like <laughs> perturbed action on like some regulatory pathway, right? So like some gene is important, uh, like it's produced at a certain rate. You have a, uh, maybe like an alternate allele that disrupts how that gene is regulated in some manner, right? And that leads to some sort of cascade through like the, some molecular pathway, right? Um, so just here as an example, um, we have uh, like a snippet of uh, GWAS, uh, excuse me, Manhattan plot for schizophrenia. We've zoomed into region 16, and one of the problems is, um, again, like interpreting these non-coding variants is really difficult. Um, it's not clear uh, when we see the association which gene it regulates, like how that risk is imparted. You know, is it multiple genes? Is it a single gene? And, and for example, here we have like kind of the zoomed in, like uh, it's called a, like a locus plot uh, or zoom plot of uh, the association signal, right? So again, the higher 
the point, the more associated it is with trait. Um, and all of these, it might be hard to see, are all the genes in the region. So does anyone want to like kind of just throw one gene out there? What do you think is driving the, the risk for this? Just looking at that, right? It's, it's impossible, you know? Well, you know, you might be really good at it, I don't know. You get a nature paper, but um, it's really difficult to tell, right? There's, there's a large number of associations that are extremely, uh, uh, look to be extremely important for this disease, uh, schizophrenia, but again, which gene does it map to? It's not necessarily clear. Um, so, so what, like, how can we go about uh, essentially like designing an experiment or designing a study to get at this, right? Our goal is to say, is not necessarily to say like, okay, GWAS has some region. What we want to do is say, what is driving the risk at this region? We want to explain that association signal, right? So what, what could we do if we just had infinite money and, and then like easy access to individuals, right? So we already know we need to collect large number of cases and controls. Um, let's go ahead and collect their genotype matrix and let's get like an, uh, 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 some, some vast catalog of gene expression, right? Through like, let's, let's like make it even easier and say we know what tissue is important, right? Um, and so we'll collect gene expression in that given tissue. So one thing that we could simply do is then just track, right, for some gene to see if the expression levels of a given gene track with disease risk, right? If we know genetics plays a role uh, for some gene, Right, that reduces our search space to those genes, and then see if expression levels track. Right? And so here, for example, we have gene A in uh, uh, green, and gene B in blue, and just like this cartoon illustrates, right? like gene B, like we probably don't need to follow up with it, because it's not tracking well. Right? Kind of, again, we have huge sample size, so let's ignore power and all those kind of confounders there. All right, well, what's the problem? Well, gene expression is, I mean, it's cheap, but if you need to collect it in large numbers of individuals, like GWAS size, right, that, that's an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, and so we don't typically have the gene expression that we want to test uh, for disease outcome, right, association with disease status or some quantitative trait, right? So, so where does that leave us? Um, well, uh, so that's where uh, we can enter um, in prediction of gene expression. So several papers, all kind of like around the same time, proposed uh, the related idea that we can leverage reference panels, things like GTEx or TCGA, where we have genotype information, we have expression information, uh, we can fit predictive models, right, that predicts gene expression, then take those weights and go back to our GWAS cohort. All right, so how does that work? Um, I sort of explained it, but we'll go into a little more detail. So let's say we have expression of some gene, we know where that's located in the genome, so we can take some region around that gene, right, in our reference panel, and we can fit just a simple linear model, right? We can add in whatever covariates we want, um, but for now, let's just assume that it's purely just genetics and noise, okay? Um, so we can fit some joint penalized regression, right, where our aim is to predict gene expression using SNPs as predictors, right? We want to penalize it uh, under some penalty function so that we don't overfit. Okay, and then what comes out are these betas, right? And so that's a weight for each SNP. Once we've done that, we can then go back to our GWAS data where we have indiv individual level genotype information for each person, right? Uh, we then take, uh, here are the genotypes represented by this matrix X, right, for this region. We take our vector beta and we simply <laughs> predict or impute the expression levels for this gene. Right, so we, we learn the weights here, we go back to our GWAS, predict into the individuals, okay? And so let's go back now. So like equipped with this mentality or equipped with this uh, uh, approach to trying to find disease genes, right? So we have our reference panel, we have our measured expression in that reference panel, we can train predictive models, we have our cases and controls, right? So now we have these weights, we have the, the GWAS genotype matrix, right, and we just, predict gene A, we do the same thing for gene B, and going back to our toy model, we just see, okay, does the predicted gene expression look like, does anyone have a guess? So the, so the way that that sort of procedure operated is we trained models, we got weights, 
and we took those weights and applied it to individual level data, how does that mesh with GWAS? Well, we typically don't have access, right, to, to, to individual level data. GWAS, now, especially nowadays, are sort of these large consortium, which are like mega overarching consortium that meta-analyze across many individual consortium. So one, there's like a logistic issue in that we don't have sort of a single genotype matrix we can just run it on, right? And then for privacy reasons, a lot of times people don't want to release the individual level data. Um, so what we do have, though, are summary statistics, okay? Um, and so what are summary stats? So here, each row in this table corresponds to a SNP that's been tested for association in the original GWAS cohort. And what comes out are the betas and the standard errors, right? Or you can think of coupling those two to get a z-score, right? That's like the, the, so here we have an effect or the log odds ratio if it was a disease, the standard error of that estimate. And combine those, we can get a z-score or the Wald statistic, whatever you want to call it. Um, and one very useful way to approximate the z-score in a GWAS cohort is under this model, right? So zi, the, the z-score at the ith SNP, should be either proportional, if it's a disease outcome, or exactly this, of just simply kind of doing the marginal regression of x on y, right? And so if everything's been centered and standardized, it turns out to just doing the dot product between the SNP measurements and the phenotype measurements for a given SNP. Is that clear? This is very kind of like underlies sort of everything whenever you see like a summary stat based method, like that's kind of the starting point. All right, so let's go back to this. How, how does that mesh with, with like this whole TWAS paradigm? Um, we, again, we have our reference panel, we, we train it on some expression, we get predictors, what can we do? Well. What happens if we just apply those weights directly to the z-scores and that, that we can just download, right? So using our definition for the z-score, right, if we expand it, we see this beta transpose x transpose y, right? And what's beta transpose x transpose? Like if anyone had that burned into their mind from a few slides earlier. Right, so if this is genotype data and these are the weights, that's equivalent to predicting the gene expression directly into the original GWAS cohort, which we do not have, right? So it's like a very powerful sort of way to model this, right? Now we can just download summary stats, take these weights, apply it directly to the summary statistics we, we've downloaded, and we get what out, what's output now is the statistic, right? Sort of the strength of association of the predicted expression of this gene with the, the quantitative trait. All right, so, so that's like kind of a lot of ground that we just covered is, is uh, are there any questions at this point? Questions. Yeah, sure, go for it. What's N? N is the sample size in the original GWAS. Okay. Yeah. Is there any reason why it was N to the negative one in the previous slide and N to the negative one here? Oh, um, let's see. It should be one half. That is a typo. Good catch. Bonus points. I'm keeping track. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, like feel free to just at any point in time. So I don't know, that was the way I'm very used to. Uh, just, you know, just shout, raise your hand, whatever. It's totally cool. Um, OK. Another question, if you don't mind. Perfect, let's do it. Beta prime Z is your Z-ish score. Yes. For the association of that gene with whatever disease. Yes. By its name. That's correct. All right, did everyone hear that question? So, so just to repeat, um, so what pops up is it's not exactly a z-score yet. It's something akin to a z-score, um, but it's, it's just the strength of association of the predicted expression using these weights and using these z-scores. We can do another transformation using the LD to make it a proper z-score, but again, that can be done, right? The, the important point is we just apply this directly to, to data we can simply download. All right, and so there's a couple different ways to interpret this whole paradigm, right? Um, we can think of it as performing a two-sample Mendelian randomization test. So it's a lot of jargon. To unpack it, it's simply estimating the mediating effect of gene expression. That's it, right? Um, and this is, the, this is kind of like the lens that Zhu et al. took in 2016. Um, so one that makes um, maybe not as strong an assumption is that this is simply a test for genetic covariance. 
Right? We're just seeing if two things co-vary. Um, and it, that's a measure of similarity uh, with like conditioning on gen genetic signal uh, and uh, between the trait and gene expression. Right? And so I think this, this sort of um, not as strict interpretation is what's taken uh, 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 in the Gamazon at all and Gusev uh, at all papers. And so TWAS has now essentially been run for all traits. Uh, and you can look at these at twas-hub.org. Uh, well, not all, but like nearly all, quite a bit. Um, so like, look, it's even easier now. Not only do like, can you down, like, download weights, apply to summary stats, we've already done that for you. Um, and so if you have a, a, gene, a trait of interest, you can go here and look it up and see like, what, what genes pop up. Or if you have a gene of interest, you can say, well, what traits pop up right on the phenome side. Um, so this is a fantastic resource. This was developed by Sasha. I highly encourage you all to check it out. Um, so just for another example, right? Here's schizophrenia. I think this study came out last year. Uh, everything's been run, and you can see each row here corresponds to um, some gene that's been tested for association. Okay, great. Um, so that's like TWAS in a nutshell. Any questions? Any other questions? While I drink. Okay, cool. Um, so we got pretty good at uh, running TWAS. Um, we were doing them a lot. And um, I want to take a brief pause and uh, just recall that the, the Manhattan plot is a plot showing association signal for each SNP in the genome, where its height corresponds to its associated signal. Um, and so if I were to ask you, what is this plotting right here, you would then all say a GWAS, right? And that looks like a GWAS, right? So is this a GWAS plot, a GWAS Manhattan plot? Right, we see these like characteristic peaks where like at a region of strong LD when there's association, lots of things pop up. So what's, what is this? Um, well, it turns out uh, that's actually on top uh, the TWAS Manhattan plot. So each point here, rather than being a single SNP, corresponds to the predicted expression of some gene in some particular tissue. Right, and on bottom, uh, we have the classical uh, SNP-based analog. Okay, and so um, this was really interesting. Um, we thought that, like, well, what's going on at a risk region, right? So, like, we do see that whenever there's GWAS signal, we tend to see like you know, sort of like a mirrored-ish, a smoky mirror maybe, uh, signal on the TWAS side, right? And so, like, what 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 could be driving that? Is it simply that there's like a complex regulatory network where like all these genes are involved? Is it is it truly the case that like I don't know, like for, for instance here, like 30 genes are involved in a risk. So, so we wanted to um, figure out what was going on. But, but one thing we do want to emphasize is that, um, again, TWAS, it's like, it's not necessarily a test for causality, right? Like under some very strong assumptions, it's consistent with that, right? Um, but it's kind of right there in the name. There's an A, right? It's an association test. Right, so what pops up is simply in a test for association. It's not really sort of like go always going to mesh with uh, uh, a causal test. Right, it's consistent with one, but just because we observe signal doesn't mean that like m risk is mediated. All right, so what we wanted to do was figure out a model that could capture this and explain it. Right, um, and so that's what we set out to do. And um, here is sort of a toy example. For, for like what, what can, like a very simple explanation that can, that can cause this signal, even if a single gene is driving risk, right? So here on the left, what we have is like, let's say it's like a locus zoom plot, right? It's a zoomed in association. Each point corresponds to a SNP. Um, here we have our predictors, right? Our weights for um, six genes in the region. Uh, only a single gene is causal, right? This, this one marked here in red. So the intensity of this, this matrix corresponds to like the strength of, of the EQTL signal, right, or like the weight. Um, and down here, we have the LD matrix, and that the, the, the darker the color, the more uh, two SNPs are correlated, right? That's, that reflects like that genetic variation is, is uh, co-inherited, um, right? And so if we simply take this kind of like bilinear form of this, what pops up is here are our gene associations, right? So these two genes are null, great, we can rule those out. Uh, but we have four genes that pass our sort of magical threshold of significance. But only a single one uh, is causal, okay? And so this matrix down here reflects uh, the correlation of predicted expression, 
right? And so really what you can think of this is like a measure of uh, uh, genetic covariance between the, the expression of these uh, uh, at this region. Right? And so now what we would like to do is say, well, what if someone gave us these associations and we could model this somehow? What we want to do is back out what's like the single gene that's driving the signal, right? That like once we condition on this gene, everything else is null, right? That would be fantastic. Um, but to do that, we, we kind of need to take one more step back and come up with like a more, what's like a formal model? How can we actually like mathematically do this? This is a nice picture. It's a nice way to think about it. But what's the model? How do you ask why, yeah. uh, why you necessarily assume a single gene? Um, that, that's a great question. Uh, so the question is, why a single gene? Well, that's simply just for this illustration. We can relax that assumption later on. OK? And we'll, so that's a fantastic point. I'll get to that later. OK, so let's think about um, some biology just a little bit. Most of us are computational folks. Um, right? And so kind of the central dogma is that DNA makes RNA makes protein, right? So ultimately, it's like proteins that are produced that that drive some some like cellular processes um, that get perturbed in some way that uh, uh, like alter risk, right? Or like drive some quantitative trait. But in our um, expression studies, right? When we fit these models, we don't really have protein data, do we? We have RNA data, right? And so we can think of that there are stochastic and deterministic effects that alter the variation in RNA. We know that, right? There are QTLs, EQTLs, and there's like, you know, of course, other covariates that may change that. Um, and this is what, what we use to fit predictors, right? There are definitely other genetic effects that can alter protein levels after sort of translation, right? Like post-translational effects. So if we use RNA, we, we want some way to sort of quantify like maybe this like residual things that we're not missing, uh, capturing. All right, so that's enough biology. Let's go to math. Um, this is going to be a lot of math. I'm going to try my best to walk everyone through it. Um, so, so let's model a, uh, uh, our uh, complex trait as this, right? So y is our vector of phenotypes, right? So let's, let's make it simpler and say this is a quantitative trait, OK? Um, x here is still our genetic data. Those are SNPs. Beta are the residual effects of SNPs on trait. And that's the residual being that we have gene expression for a large number of genes. Here, let's just say we could measure all genes, right? And so alpha are the gene level effects, right? So it's the genes that have some effect. And since we're using RNA, we want some way to kind of capture residual things that, that won't be reflected uh, in th this particular data, right? Oh, so that, that's a little more helpful, right? So we have phenotype, the genotype and effects, gene expression and their effects, plus additional environmental noise. Um, well, what's gene expression. It's a linear model, right? We've been using a linear predictor, right? So this isn't new, of the same genetics uh, plus some weight matrix now. This is a matrix because it's corresponding to multiple genes, right? And some other matrix of additional environmental noise, OK? Um, we don't have this. We predict it, right? So we have some estimator for W. We call it omega. And we apply omega to x, and we get this g hat, right? So g hat, this is like the predicted expression at all of our genes, right? And so this is our model. Um, our TWAS test statistic right, can be thought of just, do, we're going to define it to be as just doing this uh, if we center and standardize everything, um, uh, which should be the case even if we just do that the genotype because of linearity rules. Um, of just doing the dot product between predicted expression and phenotype. Yes, question. Uh, so can you go back to the last slide? Yep. Yeah, so uh, what's the difference between beta and the W? They are all genotype and the effects. So what's the difference here? Right, so here, these effects uh, are effects on gene expression. Beta are the residual effects that somehow influence the trait but aren't mediated through expression. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, OK. Right? Yes. So is G encapsulating multiple genes? Yes, that's a big matrix. And what about X? Is X just one SNP? Okay? No, it's all SNPs, okay, right? So just imagine it's like just the whole genome. Okay. And your estimator for W comes from uh, the weights, the beta. Yeah, that's just a, essentially the, these are just the weights. It's the same thing. I know I flipped the notation. Apologies. 
OK? Um, and so our, let's define our test statistic just to be this, this projection onto y of our uh, predicted expression, right? Um, so this is for zj's, like our test statistic for one gene. Um, if we replace y, right, so this is where the important part comes in. We had y, we replace that with our model, right? On the previous slide, we defined what y should, the model for y is. We simply replace y here with what the true model, we, we, we are stating the true model to be. We can reflect that across all genes at a region just by replacing this with the matrix, okay? We keep the, that the same. And sort of just pushing this G into each of these products, uh, or excuse me, terms, and then expanding the definition, we get this kind of crazy looking thing, right? So we can just call it a crazy looking thing, and I'll explain it on the next slide as we go through. But there's, there's a, a, an important meaning for each of those terms. Right? It's even more crazy. Okay, fine. Um, so what this is saying is that the z-score right, is this bilinear form of our weights, the LD, and the residual effects. Right? So there's some tagging of residual effects. And the bilinear form between our predicted weights, right, our estimators, the true weights, and then like a bunch of noise. Right? This is basically tagging a bunch of noise. Right? And so now that we have this kind of long definition, what we would like to do is define the first two moments. Because now once we have those moments defined, right, we can perform fine mapping. That's kind of our goal, right? We have these test statistics, we have a model, we would like to sort of assess what's driving the signal. Right, so let's define the expectation, right? Well, the only thing that's random in this huge term here uh, is this set here, is epsilon, our environmental noise, right? So due to linearity of expectation, we just expect it's the, the expectation of z is like the sum of the expectations, right? And essentially this we assume to be on average zero, so that goes away, and the only thing that's left are these first two terms. Okay? Um, one thing maybe I didn't emphasize enough is that we don't need to have the individual level genotype data because everything can be reflected through these LD matrices that can be estimated from 1,000 genomes. All right, so now our expectation is done, great. Let's do the same thing for the variance, okay? Um, again, the only thing that's random are the error terms, so that's the only thing we really need to worry about. Um, we assume that they are all independent of one another, right? That may be a strong assumption, but that's where we're starting from. Um, so here, the variance of z is the sum of the variances. Um, these are constants, right? There's no random terms, so those go away. Now, what's the variance of this final term? Just doing a bunch of math, and it ends up looking like this. Right? It's just this bilinear form of our estimators, LD, and the estimators. Okay? All right, so now with these defined, we can define our sampling distribution. But one thing I should add is that this term here is a function of W. We don't know W. Right? We have omega, which is an estimator for W. So we have to approximate that by using this term here. Am I doing? Oh, I am almost out of time. OK. So let me speed things up. Um, we have a model now. Um, we can replace this sort of omega v omega with this sigma term, right? So let's like, collapse it down into a single term. And so here, this sort of structurally looks similar to SNP fine mapping now. Um, and so if someone came to us and said, here are the causal genes, right? I'm going to tell you which of the genes in your data are causal, right? What would the, the conditional for that be? Well, now we have a likelihood that says, OK, we have effect sizes at causal SNPs, or excuse me, genes, uh, under some uh, uh, non-centrality parameter. Right? Um, we don't want to estimate the causal effect sizes. Even if someone tells us right, what genes are causal, we would need to estimate the effect size. We don't want to do that. So we can integrate those out. We have this sort of complicated looking uh, variance components model. Right? But again, this is uh, us sort of being able to describe the likelihood upon knowing which genes are causal. Right? Um, and we don't want that. Um, we're given z-scores, and we want to do the opposite. Right? We're given z-scores from some TWAS, and we would like to infer what this vector of like, causal indicators are. Right? Um, so that's where uh, Bayes' rule comes in. Um, we can put a prior on what is causal, is or uh, is not causal, 
and just use Bayes' rule, right, to get the posterior probability that a gene is causal or a set of genes are causal condition on the observed uh, z-scores. And so one of the benefits of this approach is that um, there are way fewer genes at a region compared to SNPs. So we can uh, enumerate this posterior most of the time completely, right? We don't have to do any approximations. Um, I'm just going to skip this in the sake of time. Um, if we do simulations where we simulate data from a set of genes, prune those genes completely, and do a TWAS, right? We shouldn't, in principle, right, we would like to see completely null because the causal genes are absent. But what we see is strong association signal, right? The stronger the LD is at a region, the more likely other genes will tag it. Okay, um, simulations hold up. Uh, one thing we did is we showed that using our approach improves the resolution, right? It reduces the number of genes that you can prioritize for some functional labs for functional follow-up uh, compared to other approaches like coloc or just using, you know, what is or is not transcriptome wide significant. Uh, we applied it to a bunch of data. It found the right things uh, as we would hope. Okay. Um, all right, I've now reached 30 minutes. Uh, right? Did I reach 30? Okay. Um, okay, so the software is available. Um, you can go to GitHub and download this. It's completely open source. There's a Python implementation. You can download it, uh, install it via pip. I'm slowly working my way to developing a Conda uh, installation. That doesn't exist yet, but you can install Conda and then use pip. Um, uh, we've released a uh, bespoke EQTL database, so all the weights are compiled together across a large number of studies. Um, it enables tissue prioritize or agnostic approach. Um, it's an efficient implementation. It's very, very fast. Right? You can run this on, a, on your large GOS data and get results quickly. Um, so I encourage you all to check it out if this is something that interests you. And, uh, and I'd like to thank all the people that were involved in this uh, in my previous lab, Buck Don, um, a bunch of grad students. Uh, Huembo, Gleb, Malika, Ruth, uh, Claudia, um, as well as Sasha at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute it was very sort of instrumental in this as well. Um, and so, uh, again, I just started my lab. So if you're interested in GWAS and regulatory genetics and are thinking about doing a postdoc soon, uh, let's chat. Um, so I'm recruiting. Uh, you can go to my website to read more. Also, if that's not enough, there are two taco trucks right outside my office. One, two, okay, like 30 second walk. So if like you're kind of interested in GOS but really interested in tacos, it's gonna be a good fit, I promise. So um, any questions? I know that was like a lot of math at the end there, so like I'm happy to sort of chat one-on-one -on -one to go into more detail.